All right. Um, can everyone hear, hear me? Great. Um, welcome to Less Than 50 Ways to Build Multi-Arch Containers. Uh, my name is Adam Kaplan. I am the architect for the Builds for OpenShift Layer product and the OpenShift Builds team. Uh, I am also one of the maintainers of Shipwright, and previously I was involved with Tecton and uh, what is now Conflux. Hello, everyone. My name is Urvashi Munani. I'm a principal software engineer at Red Hat on the OpenShift containers team, but recently switched over to OpenShift machine config operator. Um, I have been in the container space for the last six to seven years, um, so I have some experience with builds, and that's what I'm here to talk to you about with Adam. And there are exactly 49 ways to build multi-art <laughs> containers. <laughs> and that next is me, sorry. <laughs> All right, so before we get started in those 49 ways of building multi-art containers, um, what is a multi-arch container image? Um, is it just one image that you can run on any architecture? Technically, yes. Technically, no. The idea here is that you have one container file that defines your build for you. Um, you build that container image and it on multiple architectures, sorry, on different machines with multiple architectures, and then you put that together in something called a manifest list. Um, this manifest list is referred to by the same name. So regardless of where you want to run this container image, you just pass in that name. And the container runtimes are smart enough to detect which architecture you're running on, and it will pull the image down for that specific architecture. And a manifest list can have as little, little or as many different architecture images in there. You're not restricted to only like three, but you can have all the various architectures available. So why is multi-arch important? Um, as we know, different architectures have different pros. Um, depending on your use case, you may need one over the other. Uh, Multi-arch is not something new. It's been around for quite a while, but there has been an explosion in it recently just because Macs switched over to using ARM chips. Macs is one of the most popular developer machines today, and you want to have the ability to build your container images and be able to also run them in production, which is probably not an ARM chip-based infrastructure. So having the ability to easy migrate, easily migrate between infrastructures is important. Based on your use case, you might want to opti optimize for cost and performance. And as I already mentioned, even though Macs are pretty popular, they're not as cool as the Linux devs. <laughs> uh, so we have a bunch of current solutions. Um, you can have multiple build configurations for each architecture where you're building them separately, creating separate images that have separate names or separate tags, and then you have to keep track of all of this. This can be tedious and confusing. Um, there is emulation, which you can basically build images of different architectures on your same machine using something like QMU user static, which is what Podman and Builder do under the hood. But as we know, emulation can take a hit on performance. Um, so it can be pretty slow if you're trying to do something pretty quickly. Uh, and there is also cross compilation, which is as an option. All right, so uh, now for some particip particip participation <laughs> part of the demo. Um, if any of you have a phone that can read a QR code, um, I encourage you to take uh, a scan of that and fire up uh, this incredibly awesome web page that is totally suitable for production. And if it's not obvious, I am being very sarcastic, and one of the product security guys is going to yell at me in a moment. <laughs> <laughs> so it is not a curl bash script, I, I promise. Um, what you should see is uh, something that looks like this, uh, very much a Hello World app not suitable for prod. Um, I am exposing the IP address, the pod, and the node that um, this container is running on an OpenShift cluster. And uh, I have a question, did any of you pick up an arch that was AMD64? Yes, it worked. <laughs> I could not get this to work myself because load balancers on Amazon, I'm sure, are way more sophisticated and intelligent for my own good. Every time I did it, I was getting some ARM machine. Um, <laughs> so uh, you can do this on OpenShift today. It's dev preview, but Kubernetes, it's uh, been effectively GA for a while. You can have multiple compute architectures on your cluster and with the right configurations and settings. Um, and if you have a multi-arch container image, Kubernetes will take care of just distributing those containers across your cluster. You don't need to worry about anything. Um, but in order to do that, you actually have to build it. And I'm going to introduce a tool 
called Co. Um, so if folks uh, have not encountered Co before, um, it's a tool that a lot of us who are doing Go development upstream are really uh, adopting and catching on because it is truly easy Go containers. Uh, unlike Builda, you don't need a container file or a Docker file. You don't have to worry about um, the specifics of like which commands you run. It is very opinionated and will give you an image that is as minimal as possible. It's got defaults around producing software bills of materials or SBOMs. Uh, and it takes advantage of the Go SDK's native cross-compilation cross on your machine to then create multi-platform uh, container images. So to demo this, and I think I need to zoom in a little bit. So I've got that, this is the source of that uh, same demo app. Um, that first line is probably the only thing that's really suitable for production, which is the fact that I have graceful termination. Um, but otherwise, we can use Co through simple command line arguments. Um, and I have a make file that actually makes this a little simpler. And because I did this build recently, this is actually going to go super fast because on my local machine with Go, everything gets cached. Co is also able to cache the container image layers. And I configured Co um, through this co.yaml file to use UBI Micro as my base image. Um, UBI Micro is our effectively distro list version of UBI. It is just rel, no DNF, no micro DNF, no yum. It is just the kernel. Um, and then with Go, with static compilation, you can just shove your binary into that and it works. So, um, because it's UBI, we have um, the manifest list there for AMD64, ARM, PowerPC, and uh, Z with S390X, and you can kind of see that example there. Uh, and then it uh, produces all of those container images, so that's four, and then assembles them into a manifest list and pushes them to the registry. And because this is containers, there's no magic kind of um, alluding to what Kelsey said in his Keynote, containers aren't magic. It's just tarballs with some well-formatted JSON. We can actually inspect that manifest list with Podman manifest. And uh, you can see that it is just the reference and pointers to all those container images that we'll, were built. We have our Linux AMD uh, image, ARM, Power, and Z. And voila, easy multi-arch. And I think, Urbish, you know you are going to talk about Podman Farm. Yeah. All right, so uh, another thing is Podman Farm. Um, so we, at, like at the Podman team, we were thinking, how can we make multi-arch images faster? We already had emulation available, um, but that was taking a lot of performance hit. So we're like, can we kind of leverage some of the existing solutions in Podman to see if we can somehow send these builds to different machines of those native architectures, do the builds over there, and then gather all that back. Um, so we can do that, yes. So Podman has a socket that you can enable and you can connect to with Podman system connection. You just point it to the socket of that um, machine, or it can also be a virtual machine, as long as you have access to that node. Um, your container file or Docker file just lives in one location, which is on your local machine. You run a Podman farm build, essentially the same thing as Podman build. We're not reinventing anything here. We just pass over the data and container file details over to the nodes, and that runs a Podman build uh, with that, creates the image there, and then pushes it directly to a registry. So the only requirement in a Podman farm build is you have to give it a fully qualified image name. Um, and have the authentication for that registry on your local machine. You do not have to have them on the nodes. We pass that data over from the local machine to the various nodes that are running the builds. And then once that's done, we get the digest information back from the registry, put all of that together in a manifest list. That happens locally on your machine. And we also push that manifest list to the registry. So when you end up doing Podman images, you will see that manifest list locally. You can inspect it. You can see which architectures it was built for. Um, and that's basically the idea of Podman Farm. We kind of used existing solutions in Podman and figured out how to connect them to make this easy with just one command. And I have a demo on this. 
Um, it's recorded because it takes a bit, uh, so I didn't want you all to be sitting <laughs> for a few minutes here just watching it running. Um, so basically over here I have uh, two EC2 instances. One is ARM-based and one is AMD-based. These are rel nodes that I have over there. Um, <laughs> sorry. Uh, yeah, and over here I'm just showing that uh, one machine is x86 and one is um, ART64. Yeah, I don't know the different names for the same thing. <laughs> um, and basically I'm enabling the Podman socket and starting that, and we can see here that it's active on my machine. Doing the same thing for the other machine there, um, and that will enable me to connect to this from my local machine. So that's also active and running in the other uh, EC2 instance I have. So now I'm back on my local machine here. Uh, Podman system connection is what you use to add those connections. Uh, so I just did an LS to see which ones I have connected right now. And with Podman system connection add, I'm adding um, the path to the sockets on those two different machines. Uh, so now when I do LS, I'll have four over here and I can give them whatever name that I like. I've named them rel AMD and rel ARM. Um, and a farm really is just a group of these system connections. You can have as many as, much, as many as you want, or you can just have even zero in them, but a farm is essentially a group of these system connections. So then when you, are, when you do build for those farm, it will target those specific machines. Um, so I created a farm called DefConf, and I added the rel AMD and rel ARM uh, system connections into that. And I have this simple container file here. Um, it's building a Llama CPP model, which as we know, building AI models are pretty heavy and time, they take a lot of time to build. Um, I just wanted to show you the difference in using uh, emulation versus using native architectures to build it for two different architectures. So that's the container file for that. And we're going to time this process. Um, and the Podman farm build command, very simple to, similar to Podman build, same flags and everything. The only difference is you, you can pass in which farm you want to use, and I'm specifying the DefCon farm. One more thing is that um, we have this local flag. So if you set that to true, it will build on your machine, the local machine, as well as all the farm nodes. Um, if you don't want it to build on your local machine, you just set that to false. And as I mentioned, you have to pass it a fully qualified image name. And as you can see, it's quay.io, my username, and then I'm calling it llama cpp farm. Um, and then just passing in the container file and context directory, as we always do. So over here, we can see that it gives you output. It tries to connect to the different nodes. We see rel arm. It's connected to rel arm, rel AMD. They're both ready, and then that means the farm is ready. As many nodes as you have in your farm, it will connect to all of those and first check um, the status of them before starting the builds. And the builds happen in parallel. Um, we wait for all the builds to happen before we then push the images to the registry specified. Uh, we push untagged images um, on, the, on the nodes. The images built are unnamed and untagged, but then when we push them, we give it the name that you specified while building the image, but they are still untagged because we need to put this all back together in a manifest list. And it's your manifest list that will have the tag, not the specific images inside that manifest list. Um, so I fast forwarded this. As we can see here, the build was successful for both of them. It tells you um, right there, uh, copying, uh, it generated an image manifest list from two images. and. Um, when we do Podman, oh yeah, and we see that the time taken here is three minutes, uh, about, and three minutes about eight seconds uh, for this whole build to happen on those native architecture nodes. And when we do Podman images, we see that the manifest list was created, and when we inspect the manifest list, um, we can see that the two architectures that we were building for are there. So we have our multi-arch image ready. Um, so now the next thing that I'm, uh, yeah, and then I'm gonna show you what it looks like on query.io, how you can see that. Uh, so you go there, you go to your tags, and then you look at child manifests, and we can see the ARM64, AMD64 um, builds over there. So yeah, so now when you go and pull, try to pull this image based on the architecture of your machine, it will pull that specific architecture down. All right, so that was building with farm. Now this one is basically, building using emulation. So the first thing I need to do is actually I need to create the manifest list manually. So I do podman manifest create, and I just created a called defconf no farm. 
Um, this will not have any information in right now because there are no images assigned to this manifest list right now. It's an empty manifest list. And then I'm just going to do a Podman build, um, use the platform flag, pass in the platforms I want to build for, which is AMD64 and ARM64, pass in the manifest that I want the build to add the images to, um, and then just pass in the container file and context directory as always. And the build gets started, and we're going to time this build as well. Um, I've also fast forwarded this. It should cut soon towards the end. <laughs> or not. Let's do that. I don't have good video editing skills. Anyways, so is that done? Yep, so that's done. And as you can see there in the tiny part there, it took 11 minutes and 35 seconds to run this same build with emulation for those two architectures. So we're basically four times, almost four times faster uh, with the native architectures and using Podman Farm uh, to build the same container file. Uh, we can see the images were built locally because everything happened on my machine with emulation. And when we inspect it, we have both the same arch the architectures as expected in the manifest list. Um, so yeah, so that's the demo um, kind of comparison using Podman Farm, which uses machines of those native architectures to do the builds for you, versus using emulation, which uses the QMU user static package um, to do the builds for you. Yeah. Thanks. So as as you saw, um, when you have native machines, you get uh, significant performance improvements, and not only just for Red Hat customers, but for us internally. Uh, Performance matters when you're trying to do things at scale. If every single build takes 11 minutes just to get the container image, and you're producing, say, the OpenShift payload, which is 200 container images, and they are literally building that every single minute of every single day, um, that is going to fall apart very quickly. So, uh, what we're, what you can do, um, although we're not doing it uh, quite yet with Conflux. Um, is use Tecton to orchestrate your builds, and it we can. It's called a pipeline, uh, and it's a. I'll, since we're running short on time, I'll just uh, kind of very quickly show how this works. Um, it's going to look very similar to uh, how Podman Farm works, where we're going to get the source code, we're going to build it, and we're going to um, spread the build across the different architecture machines that we have, and then we have to uh, push this to a manifest list. And since we're on OpenShift, I can actually do this. Um, I've actually done this on uh, my cluster already. Um, here, let me, if I go to the, um, so if I'm on the developer view here, I can click on pipelines, and you can see what that pipeline looks like. Um, and if you look at the most recent pipeline run that I was doing when I was experimenting here, um, it more or less does the same thing. It will clone the source code, it will build uh, the image on each node, um, AMD and ARM64. The one kind of catch is that you can't really do this directly through the console or even through the TKN command line. Uh, and the reason for that is because in order for you to spread the build out with the Tecton uh, pipeline, you have to create what is called this pipeline run object. And one of the config, you have to pass it a config option called a task run spec. Um, this is actually, I think, a fairly newer part of the Tecton API. Uh, and what it lets you do is override the pod template that uh, the, the, the Tecton task actually uses when it runs on Kubernetes so that you can inject things like the node selector. This is how Kubernetes knows that, oh, this workload needs to run on a specific type of machine. Uh, when you create a Kubernetes node, one of the things that every single Kubernetes node does is it uh, adds these labels to themselves, um, which is the architecture and the operating system. So uh, since everything's Linux, I didn't felt like I didn't need to pass in the Kubernetes OS, uh, but I did need to make the, uh, uh, the architecture, uh, and if I want to actually like do that, and if I can, maybe if I'll, I'll just show how you could do this. So if I do just OC create, um, 
we can kick off a new pipeline. And there we go. So here's like the one that's running. It'll clone the source. Um, and then it'll start building um, the nodes. Uh, another sort of caveat with this is that um, you can, in theory, get parallel builds, but you need a persistent volume uh, CSI driver storage class that supports read uh, either read write many or uh, read many write once. Um, and by default, stock OpenShift IPI on AWS doesn't give you that. So um, these will run serially, but you could get parallel performance uh, with the right uh, stuff on your cluster. Um, and so once that's there, it gets pushed to the container registry. Uh, you can see I have it here on Quay, and it's the same exact manifest list. You can pull it up, and you can see it references the individual images on uh, AMD64 and Linux. And if you're on OpenShift 2, you can pass these to the internal registry as well. Uh, I forgot when they added manifest list support, um, but that's there. Um, this pipeline is using only the internal registry, and it works. So, um, um, with that, um, are there any questions? I think we have some time. I think uh, up from Sam's got a question. Admin farm is the only way to get the image that was built on the farm on your machine that started it to then go and pull it from the registry or is it possible to have the farm nodes send what they build back? Uh, so yeah, the only way is to actually pull it down from the registry. Uh, initially the plan was to pull them back to the local machine then create everything there, but that was a lot of, uh, because when we copy we're essentially creating two copies when we move it from one location to another, so there was no good way of making that performance. So that's why we like a best solution is to just directly push it to the registry and then you can pull it onto any machine and it will just pull the architecture that you, you need. Jeff's got a question. Is there a podman farm create command that will set up the machines that you want to set up so that you can do the builds on the architectures you specify? Uh, Through emulation if you need it locally or so on. Uh, no, there, the Podman farm create right now just creates that group of connections. Um, we really don't have a way of enabling the sockets remotely on the machines that you need. That is something that you're going to have to set up in the beginning. And as of now, I don't think there's any solution to doing that. You, you couldn't like create a custom ignition that would do that? Yeah, for, that is possible. Okay. Yeah. And then for Adam, um, <coughs> does KO allow us to take um, customer applications as they exist today and just throw them into it and it will create all the different variations of uh, those architectures and then kind of give us that same kind of choice? So there's two things that need to happen to satisfy the customer need. One is that it's got to be just a stock Go application and I also want to say, although I'm not wholly confident of this, that it's got to be statically linked. Um, that's kind of, to me, the magic that makes this all work is that Go by default is doing static linking and your binary that you get out doesn't necessarily care about the operating system underneath it. It will just do its thing. Um, if you disable static linking, um, which are certain environments require that, um, I think this kind of falls apart. Um, I actually haven't tried Co. I don't even know if you can actually disable Cgo um, with Co. Now that now that you mention it. Um, and the other th piece of it, and um, this is part. Uh, if I go back to um, the code of the example application, um, so I have this code.yaml where you can have your kind of overrides of the Co defaults in tree. And so um, by default, it uses a chain guard static image now. Uh, it was, uh, I think, the Google distro list image originally. Um, but that image is only uh, ARM and uh, AMD64. So 
if you pass it the platform all flag, it'll only build for the um, OSs and architectures that are in the manifest list of that base image. Hey, um, say that there was a CVE that was architecture specific and I needed to rebuild all of my multi-architecture images because they had that CVE. Would it be straightforward to just update those multi-architecture images for that architecture or would I need to build everything? So I guess, uh, I don't know if everyone is able to hear the question. So the question is, if you have a CVE that only affects one architecture, do you need to rebuild the whole thing? Um, I th so I guess, I think my answer would be, I think it's, you would have to rebuild the image for the architecture that's affected, and then you have to update the manifest list. And n getting back to, Echoing Kelsey uh, from, from yesterday, um, this is not magic. This is just you're updating an image and a tag. So then it depends on how you're deploying that manifest list in the customer environment. So, or, or, you're, or you're, if you are, you are operating this thing, how you are deploying this in your environment. So if it's a tag, then you might have to, if you're just using tags, then you might have to worry about, you know, how do I roll this out to Kubernetes deployments? Do I have something that's gonna trigger that? Uh, if you are using, um, if you're referencing images by digest, and I highly recommend that you do that, um, then you have to have a mechanism that will update the digests for everything that is deployed that image. So it's it's not an easy problem to solve, in my opinion. I don't know what you want to say. Uh, yeah, no, I I believe with Podman you can update manifest lists, but I think when you add a new one, you might have to delete the old one for that architecture. I don't think that happens automatically. Um, because those images don't have tags, so it doesn't get replaced. Um, they're just like, they're, they're like, their identification is the digest, so those will be different every time you build it, basically. So I haven't tried this yet, that's just what I'm thinking, but definitely give it a try. <laughs> and I think, so you mentioned this when we were um, putting this talk together, that um, because if you have push an image that isn't tagged, depending upon the registry you're pushing it to, um, that image might not sit around. Uh, Quay, for example, if you untag an image, it can get garbage collected and then the digest disappears. Um, OpenShift internal registry, I don't think behaves that way. I could be wrong though. Um, um, and you know, it's a buyer beware situation, I guess, if you're not tagging that image. Um, my actual demo, if you look at the code, um, it actually is tagging the individual architectures and then has a separate tag for the manifest list. Um, that's probably not ideal in a production environment. 